Okay. So, come on, people. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Fernanda Stanislaki. She is a biologist by training with a PhD in molecular biology and biotechnology, and she currently holds an uh, she currently holds an associate professor position at the Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul. She founded the Parent Science Move Movement aimed at supporting researchers in the challenging conciliation of motherhood and academia, as well as promoting public policies to increase the participation and rotation of women in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So everyone, it's an honor to have her again in the third edition of the program. So I welcome everyone to welcome her. Thank you, Natalia. Hello, everyone. Are you listening? Is everything okay, Natalia? Yes, we can listen to you. <laughs> okay. So it's always a pleasure to participate on this uh, program. Uh, and we are going to talk today about gender gap in science. And before we start, I just want to tell a little bit more about myself because I think it's uh, interesting to discuss a, a few things. So as Natalia has said, I'm a biologist by training and uh, I'm a professor uh, right now. And I'm a mom of three little boys. And that's the reason why we started the Parenting Science Movement in 2016. And since then, I've been engaged in this uh, topic of uh, women in science, and more specifically about mothers in science. And I'm not sure how familiar you are with the topic of uh, women in science, but there is an urgent need to talk about it and actually do something about it. And that's because that is a problem that hasn't changed uh, over the years. Uh, as I mentioned, we founded the Parenting Science Movement in 2016. And in 2017, Elsevier, one of the biggest uh, publishers in the world, has released a report on gender equality in science. And one of the results, the results they showed was that in Brazil, 49% uh, uh, of the authors that were registered in any of the uh, Elsevier um, journals, they were women. So a lot of people start talking, okay, we do not have a gender problem in science in Brazil because half of the papers that are published have uh, female authors and everything. And even though it's positive that we do have a lot of women publishing, uh, we do have a gender issue in science and that's what we are going to talk about it. And I always like to start with one picture because it means much more than me talking that we still have a problem. In, uh, regarding gender in science. And so in 2017, the same year that Elsevier has released the report saying that we have a lot of women publishing in Brazil, um, the university here, the uh, Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul has made a ceremony to, um, to celebrate the, the professors from the universities that are members of the Brazilian Academy of Science. And if you look at that picture, you can clearly see that we do have a problem when we are talking about gender in science and when we are talking about diversity in a more broad sense, because if you look at it, you'll see only white people in there and you see three women. There are members of the, there are professors from the university and are members of the Brazilian Academy of Science. So we do have a big problem regarding the diversity in science and that includes talking about women in science. Uh, why do we need to talk about diversity in science? Why does it matter? So we do have now a lot of evidence that show that diversity, um, not only of gender, but race and everything else that we can think of when we are talking about diversity, uh, it makes a more excellent science because people that have different backgrounds, different life experience, they will ask different questions and the way they are going to answer these questions are, al are also influenced by their background. So one of the papers that is really important when we are talking about this is this one that have analyzed over a million 
a PhD thesis on the US and they have showed that uh, the under, underrepresented group is, groups, uh, both women and uh, black people, they produce higher rates of innovation. So if we care about excellence in science, we should be discussing diversity. And that includes talking about women in science. Uh, specifically about gender, there are a lot of publications also showing that we, uh, gender diversity leads to better science. So we should no longer be, be worried about why we should be discussing this. We should be discussing what are we doing to change the scenario, okay? Uh, I'm pretty sure some of you have already seen this representation that is called the leak pipeline. So worldwide, uh, today we have more than 50% of the undergrad students uh, being female. The same thing for master's students. Then there is a little decrease when you go to PhD students. We have around 43% of the PhD students candidates uh, being female. But when we go uh, further along the academic ladder and talk about researchers, we only have around 30% of female researchers. So there is something that happens during the academic uh, career that we start losing women. And the situation here in Brazil is not different than the situation we have in the other places in the world. Uh, today, we have around 57% of our undergrad students being female, around 52% for uh, grad students, master and PhD students. But if we start looking at the other steps on the academic uh, career, we'll see that again, we are starting to lose women to the point that only now, this year, we have our first uh, female minister of science and technology. And last year was the first time in 105 years that we had a female president of the Brazilian Academy of Science. So we do have a problem of representation of female uh, researchers and scientists when we are looking at the top positions within the Brazilian academic system. And one thing that is really important to mention is that these are considering women in general. If we look at black women or indigenous women, the problem is even bigger. For instance, the PhD advisors in Brazil, all the PhD advisors, we have only 3%, they are black female uh, professors. So there is a lot of things that need to change because I'm pretty sure I don't have to tell you that this is not a matter of competence. It's not that women are not made to be scientists or they are not competent in, in their professional lives. There are a lot of systemic barriers that prevent women from pursuing a career in science and advancing their career in science. And that's why we are going to talk a little bit today. So the problem is quite complex. It's not just one factor that will uh, impose these barriers uh, for women in science. So I'm going to talk about a few of these factors, not all of them. And of course, I'll talk a little bit more about parenthood because that's the one uh, factor we've been studying for the last uh, six to seven years here in Brazil. So the main causes of gender inequality in science, we can uh, talk about a few of them today. And we are going to talk about gender stereotypes. Uh, harassment and parenthood. So regarding gender stereotypes, we still live in a society where uh, women from the earliest age are told that there are professions that are made for them and there are some profession that professions they are not um, able to pursue. And I really like this study that was done with children of um, six, uh, five, six, and seven years old. So they gather these kids and they describe it a professor, um, uh, a person that was really brilliant. And they ask the children to say if that person was a female or a male. And at five years old, usually kids tend to say that the brilliant person is the one the same gender of them. So girls will say that it is a female that is really brilliant, and boys will say that it is, a, it is a male that is really brilliant. But right after, if they do that with six and seven year olds, 
uh, they see a different pattern. Kids, boys, is still saying that a brilliant person is a male, but girls start saying that brilliant persons are also males. They decrease the amount of uh, the percentage of uh, girls that will say that a brilliant person is a woman. And that is really early. And we're talking about small kids. And that, of course, will uh, influence how they see some of the professions that are uh, linked to brilliancy, such as science. We are always talking about how smart someone has to be to be a science and everything. So that will influence what girls will choose as a career and what boys will choose in a career. And the main difference we have considering five to six year olds are school. So we have in our uh, education uh, institutions a problem when we are talking about it because even if it is not intentional, in schools they see difference uh, on the treatment they are given to boys and girls, the activities they are given to boys and girls and, and so on. So from early on, we have a problem about uh, gender stereotypes that we need to start addressing. Otherwise, we still have a lot of problem uh, regarding the careers that these uh, girls will choose. Um, there is this other study that was done with kids from um, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, and Mexico, Mexico City. And again, 90% of the girls said that engineering was a boy thing. And there is no reason for them to think of that other than people are telling them that because they have not any experience of anything related to the profession itself, but we are always reproducing these stereotypes in that it's quite drastic that 90% of the girls will say that engineering is a boy thing. So it's a really big issue and we need to address that. When you go to, okay, we're talking about kids and that will also influence their choices. And it is one problem that we need to tackle. When we're talking about gender stereotypes, there are problems also in our higher education and research institutions. So I really like this paper that's uh, from Moss Huckusing in 2012, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So what they have done is to build a resume and it's exactly the same one. And they change the neighbors, putting John or Joanne. And they send out this resume for a position as a lab assistant in the university. And it's quite drastic the difference uh, in assessing this uh, CV with the name John or with the name Joanne. So, one thing, and if that happens regardless of the uh, professor that is evaluating the CV, if that is, a, if it, uh, the, they are a female or male, both, they, they assess the CV in the same way. And they say that uh, for John, he is more competent, he is more efficient, and then he deserves a better salary than Joanne. And remember, there is no difference in the CV, only the name. So we will see that it probably is unconscious. No one is say, oh no, he's a man, so he is better at the job, but, these uh, stereotypes are so ingrained in our society, including within academia, that it happens. There is another paper that was done in 2016, if I'm not mistaken. And also, besides gender, they also include information uh, on race. They use really typical names there. You could infer it's a Latin person or is a, a, an Asian person. And again, they see that exactly the same CV is evaluated different if it is a male or a female um, candidate, and if it is from different parts of the world. So we do have these gender stereotypes and other kind of stereotypes that will lead to this bias in all the processes we have in the university. And of course, that will hinder women when they are trying to move along on the career and trying to advance on their career, okay? Uh, that is not only happening in hiring process or CV evaluations. There are a lot of data now showing that the uh, peer review of science uh, scientific articles, they all, it is also a very biased process. So this uh, paper was published in Trends of Ecology and Evolution. And what they have done is uh, when I, they adopt double blind reviews 
in the in the the journal. So you we usually do not know who the reviewers are, but in this case, the reviewers also did not know who the authors were, and they say and they see a shift in the uh, percentage of uh, acceptance rate, the acceptance rate uh, regarding female and male authors. So if they knew it was a female or male author, uh, the levels of um, acceptance for the papers for female were lower than males. And if they change that, they see an 80% change in the amount of papers written by women that were accepted on the, uh, on the journal. So there is a lot of these steps on the academic uh, career that is influenced by this bias. And we have all the data. It's not a problem that no one is aware of, but it's still there are very few uh, initiatives within our institutions, our universities that deal with this situation. So it is something that has to be, um, that has to be uh, somehow solved. Uh, regarding uh, published um, peer review, uh, this paper is also really interesting because other than numbers, they also show uh, the comments the reviewers have made about the, the applicants for these uh, grants they were uh, analyzing. And it's quite shocking. You can read one of the, the comments that says that despite being a woman, the principal investigate, uh, investigator was trained by several other uh, leading men. So maybe she was okay to, to lead the proposed research. There is no other reason for this comment to happen other than the bias of the person that was evaluating this, uh, this application. Uh, because if the CV is okay, the project is okay, what's the need to say anything related to what was said? So of course, um, this may not have a, a, a mid, an immediate impact, because probably this PI has received the grant because it said, okay, she's okay to lead the, pro the proposed research. But imagine if you are receiving an evaluation about a project you have written and you see that. They really, really harm someone that reads that because you start to think, okay, am I competent? Or it's just because I was training by this or other person that I got the grant or anything else. So we can no longer accept any of this behavior within academia and all the scientific environment, and we need to do something uh, about it. Other than uh, the gender stereotypes and everything, harassment is another big problem we have within our universities and our research uh, institutions. And usually it's a problem that we don't talk about it because it's uncomfortable. It can bring a lot of repercussion for the universities and they don't want that, but it is something that happens. So I brought some examples uh, in 2018. Um, here in, in my university, there is this project called Meninas na Ciencia and they have um, done this campaign and asked for students to say something that their professors have um, mentioned in class or have made a comment about them. And you can see the kind of comments that were made about female students. Something about uh, the way they were dressing or the, the kind of uh, courses they, or they choose because they imply that uh, there are courses that are more hard and then women are not going there. And a lot of comments about the way women look and why they are in there. So again, this may sound like a joke and always not harmful, but it is because you are not supposed to be hearing this inside your university and that will for sure affect the people that are suffering this kind of harassment. And here at the university in 2020, they have done a study to put some numbers on this matter of harassment. So what they have show is that moral harassment and sexual harassment happens within the university. All the uh, groups are affected. They are 
uh, the evaluated students, staff, and professors. Uh, but you'll see that in all groups, both for moral and sexual harassment, females, students, staff, or professors, they suffer a higher degree of harassment, both moral and sexual. So it is a really big issue, and that will influence a lot uh, women stay in the academic career because it's not uh, okay to be in a hostile environment that will influence your um, productivity, that will influence everything, including the, if you want to stay in that environment or not. For those that uh, are on the fields that have uh, field trips or any kind of field jobs, um, there is also another problem because it's a situation that put women at risk for harassment and even assault. So they have done this study uh, and they have shown alarming rates of harassment that had happened uh, in field trips or few, any kind of field experiences that um, they had. So you have over 70% of the, the women that were interviewed say that they have, they have suffered harassment in any of the field trips or anything they have participated. So that is quite drastic. And if, if we are talking about sexual assault, the actual violence against women, you have more than a quarter of the females that were interviewed saying that they have suffered any kind of assault. That is unacceptable. We cannot say that, oh, it doesn't happen a lot. It's just some exceptions. It is not. We are talking about 25% of females that have gone to any kind of bad uh, serious experience in field trips or anything like that. So it is a really big issue. And the last factor, when we are talking about women uh, progressing in their career in science, it's parenthood and care. And that's what I can talk about with more property because it's what I, we have been studying here for the last uh, seven years almost. So just to tell you a little bit, what is the parenting science movement? So we started the movement in 2016. At that time, we were a group of seven uh, researchers. We were five, uh, six females and one male researcher. We were almost all professors from the south of Brazil. So there was something uh, that it was because it was uh, the parenting science was founded by me and people were close to me. We had this um, the thing was almost all uh, professors from the south of Brazil. So we started the movement. We didn't know for sure what we were going to do, but we were all going through the same thing. Of uh, we were recent hired at the university and we had small children and we are not. Uh, able to do things the way we were used to do, uh, and we start suffering consequences, especially about getting grants and everything else. So we decided we were going to do something. We didn't know for sure what we were going to do, but something had to be done, and we decided we were going to initiate the Parenting Science Movement. Over the time, we have grown a lot. Today, the Parenting Science Movement is a movement of uh, 90 scientists, from all Brazil, we are in all regions. We are in 59 uh, higher education institutions in Brazil. Uh, we are organized in pods. So we have the central pod. There are this group of 17 people that you are looking at in there. These are the people that coordinate the movement with me. Uh, and we also have our regional pods. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later. So why do we need to talk about parenthood in science? And we have a lot of data now. When we started the parenting science movement in 2016, we didn't have a lot of data. But today we have data from Brazil that we have produced. But we also have a, a lot of data from different countries. And one paper that is really interesting is this one that was published in 2019. So they have evaluated the professionals in the US, the STEM professionals, um, scientists on the US. And what they have observed is that 43% of the female scientists ended up giving up of their career or opting for part-time jobs. So they were not dedicated to science exclusively. And that is quite a lot. 
uh, that 42% of the females that had children, I forgot this little detail, they had children changed their, their career. That happens to fathers too. So they, they show that 23% of fathers end up leaving academia or opting for, for part-time jobs. Uh, but that's quite different. And, and that's why we need to talk about it. So we are investing a lot of money and effort, and, and effort in putting people into the system. And we are losing half of the females that are entering the system because they become moms and their careers are going to change, but the system do not accept that. So that's why we need to talk about it. And the parenting science, we kept the name in English because we didn't want to leave anything related to gender. And in Brazil, even though uh, pa paternidad is supposed to be a neutral term, it is not. So we left in English because parent is someone that has children. It doesn't matter if it is male or female. But all I'm going to show you uh, is basically focused on mothers. And that's because we live in a society uh, where women are the ones that do all the caring. I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, about that. But also because we have data now showing that the impacts for mothers and fathers are quite different. I really like this paper that is from, well, again, it's from a scientist on the US and Canada, but we can translate the results for uh, other countries. So they have, they have analyzed uh, productivity, uh, meaning publications. In the few years after uh, the arrival of children, and what they saw is comparing uh, mothers with women with no kids and fathers with men with no kids, women tend to have, mothers tend to have a really huge decrease in productivity in this, a few years after the, they become moms but that doesn't happen to fathers. So I, I brought a few of this, uh, the examples they have in the paper. So for computer science, they saw a decrease in publication rate for mothers in around 17%. Fathers did not have any change when they are compared to childless men. In business, quite surprising, uh, women had a decrease in, in productivity. Men start publishing more and fathers start publishing more than childless men. And the one field they, all, they, was, they saw also a decrease in productivity for fathers was in history. But if you compare the numbers, it's quite different. So that's why uh, most of the uh, initiatives you will see around the world and all that we have done here in Brazil, it's tailored to mothers because we, there is a difference on the impact. And as I mentioned, that is because we live in a society and in all sectors, there is no difference when I'm talking about uh, university professors or anything, any other sector in our society, women are the ones that are responsible for caring. So all this reality are going to impose a heavier burden for women when they become moms, then for men when they become fathers. And these family obligations may lead to a slowdown in their careers or even a break. It is not uncommon if you look at that CV, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit more uh, later on. If you look at my CV, you see some gaps in my publications because when I become a mom, I have, uh, I'm a mom of three now, so there are a lot of leaves in there. Uh, we'll see these gaps in my CV. And you probably won't see that uh, on men that have data on, on that. So we have these breaks. And the question is, is the system we have today in the academic system ac accepting these breaks? Or what are, what's happening when we have these breaks on the female careers? And the problem is uh, the ideal career we have in science it's a linear career. You do not get to have any pause or any deviation or any break in your career because then you have a lot of problems in returning to your career and advancing with your career. And that's because we have this really, really, really rigid system. You are supposed to finish your undergrad, go to grad school, and then maybe a postdoc in a, a position at university. 
if you have any stops in the middle of the way, you will be seen as someone that is not determined, someone that is not really uh, committed to your career. And the system will penalize you. And when we are talking about caring, the mothers are the ones that will, are going to suffer this, uh, these penalties because they are the ones caring. So it is not just a matter of resilience, because you, you, I heard that when I started having problems with my career and a lot of women have heard that, oh, you just have to push a little bit more, maybe dedicate yourself a little bit more. Uh, it's just, you have to do something. And it's not that because we have a culture in our uh, academia and in our research institutions that really drives diversity away because we have this preconceived idea of how you should be conducting your career. So there is this paper on the graphic I'm showing you. It was a paper about the COVID, the pandemic. And what, what was more shocking about this paper was not the data about COVID because we knew women were suffering a harder, harder hit. But what they did was to compare how many hours a scientist worked before the pandemic or during the pandemic. In the data before the pandemic, if you look at it, you see that most of the, uh, the scientists, they are used to work 60 hours or more a week. And that is normalized. That's the way we see it. We are proud of saying, oh, I don't have weekends. I work all the holidays. I don't, have, I don't take vacations. We are proud of that because that's how we were uh, that's how we see the, the, the academic career, something that you have to devote all your life. You cannot do anything else. And that for a lot of people, especially women, that is unattainable. And if you are a mom, you will not be able to work 80 hours a week. That is not going to happen. And that's why uh, women suffer so much when they become moms, because we are still waiting. They will be working 80 hours a week. That's the pattern they should be following and that's not going to happen so we need to do something about that we need to change our culture but that is kind of hard to do and that is something that takes a lot of time because we need awareness we need to people to be aware that there is a problem it's not an individual problem it's not me Fernanda that was not able to keep up with my career when I became a mom it's a systemic problem the barrier the barriers there exist are imposed by the system. It's not because I became incompetent after the, uh, becoming a mom. So to speed up the change, we need changes in legislation. We need policies and affirmative actions that will consider motherhood. And also we need everybody involved. A lot of times we will see people from the base discussing this issue. But if people there on the top are not, discussing it and are not open to change, things are not going to change because they are the ones that make the decisions. They are the ones that have the resource to promote change. So we need all the academic community uh, committed to change. And that is not something that is easy to do. So the mission of the Parenting Science Movement was to change how parenthood, more specifically motherhood was perceived within academia. So we can have a more fair environment. Uh, we started by raising the discussion and also generating data so we could uh, have something to encourage the development of support policies. They are aimed to mothers. And when we are talking about gender, especially here in Brazil, we cannot talk about gender and motherhood without talking about race. All the data we have will always uh, show an association of the impacts uh, there is a gender impact, there is a motherhood impact, there is a race impact. They are all uh, connected. So we cannot talk about motherhood without bringing all these intersections. And that's a quite hard uh, task, but that's the mission we had. And our goals are always to raise awareness about the problem, to analyze the problem and generate data because we kind of have some uh, theori uh, theoretical reference uh, when we start working, but we did not have data numbers to put on. So we decided to do something and 
that was the way we uh, found to demand support policies. The academic system, our universities, uh, there is a lot of bias and prejudice against women in general, and especially mothers. We'll have a lot of um, misconceptions about moms, uh, professional moms, including scientists, where uh, people always assume that after becoming a mom, women will not be dedicated to their career as before. They do not have the same aspirations they have. And that is just false. And we need to uh, fight this kind of bias because that will impact uh, women's staying in the career. And in the end, what we want and what we need is to build a really strong network to promote these changes and how we are trying to uh, achieve these goals. So about awareness, since 2018, we always uh, do annually, well, during the pandemic we didn't, but we had the Brazilian Symposium on Motherhood and Science. It's a really important moment for us because it's um, when we get together and we are able to discuss our demands, what's happening, uh, what has changed and, and everything. The first symposium was held in, 12, uh, in 2018 and it was really a land, uh, landmark for the parenting science movement because we had a lot of uh, people participating and we have a, a round table with funding agencies to happily that was there. Uh, it was really important because we were able to organize our demands. And a lot of things there were uh, established at this event in, 12, uh, in 2018, we, have, we were able to accomplish. So it was really an important landmark for us. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about our demands. One of the demands that were uh, raised at this event in 2018 was, I, I mentioned to you that I have these gaps on my CVs, and that is a really common thing for women when they become moms, they will go on leave, they will stay away for six months, a year or so. And of course, there will be uh, gaps on their CVs because of the, uh, well, everything that changes with motherhood. And at that point, we didn't have any way of saying, okay, these gaps, there is a reason for these gaps on the CV. So we created the campaign, the Maternidade no Lax campaign. You'll see everybody with the shirts with their kids' name on. Uh, we deliver a letter to CNPq, that uh, is the agency that uh, coordinates the, the Lax platform where all the Brazilian scientists have their CV registered. So we present the proposal that within the Lax uh, CV, there should be a space where people could put the information about career uh, breaks due to motherhood. So the letter was delivered to CNPq in June, July of uh, 2018. We have a lot of meetings, a lot of things happening. The letter we delivered was signed by 34 um, scientific societies in Brazil, including the Brazilian Academy of Science. And it took three years for them to change the CV, the largest platform. So in April uh, 15, 2021, there was an update on the Lattes platform. And now there is a, a field in there called Leaves. And within this field, you can inform your uh, periods of uh, maternity leave. You are seeing there my CVs with the three uh, leaves I had because of uh, my children. So this had a lot of uh, reper repercussion. And there are practical, practical uh, consequences of the inclusion of the mother, motherhood gaps on the, uh, the motherhood data on the CVs, but there was also important because we took motherhood out of in invisibility. We always try to hide our personal lives in, okay, because it doesn't matter, we are scientists, it's a really pragmatic, um, uh, profession, we do not mix our personal and professional lives. And of course, there are boundaries, but we cannot separate both things. The, the scientist I am has influenced my personal life and the other way around. So hiding motherhood, it did not help us in, in any way. So we decided to make it public. But other than that, uh, because we had this data showing that in Brazil, 
the same thing that was observed for other, other countries uh, was also observed in here that after the, the children arrives, there is an impact in publication rates for females. We did not see that for child, childless women or men, even if their fathers are not, there is no clear impact in any point of their career. Uh, but for mothers, we see that there is uh, the birth or the adoption of a child, there is this decrease. Because we had now the information on autism and because we have the data to back it up, a lot of uh, agencies and institutions, universities, is start to incorporate motherhood uh, in any process that involves CV evaluations. So we are talking about fellowships applications, graduate student selections, a hiring process, process, grant applications, everything that have a, a, a process of CV evaluation. Some of the agencies, some of the universities have adopted a specific um, clause that we call the motherhood clause, uh, where there will be any kind of uh, affirmative action for mothers. That could be, uh, instead of looking five years on the CV, they will look at seven or eight years. Um, there are correction factors because we have data now in showing, okay, in, uh, was in computer sciences, women will uh, publish 20% less after the arrival of the children. So there is a 1.2 correction factor that is applied on the CV evaluation and so on. For um, some fellowships, there were universities that were adopting quotas. So these five fellowships are exclusively for uh, scientists with children and so on. So in our website, we can find this uh, document with a lot of examples of uh, calls and selection process, everything that include uh, motherhood. And happily, uh, this, uh, document is outdated because right now it's a lot more common to have these initiatives. Just want to make a little comment about the pandemic because even though we are way past the worst of the pandemic, the pandemic has had a lot of impacts on the careers of scientists in general. Everybody was impacted, but it was a really big impact for female science, especially mothers. So in 2020, when we were in the midst of the social isolation, the schools were closed and everything, we were really worried what, what was going to happen with uh, the females, mothers, uh, academics, uh, because of these new conditions. We were, uh, everybody at home, all the caring uh, situation was uh, impacted. We did not have schools, we did not have support from grandmas or anything. So we wrote this letter that was published in Science in 2020 about the impact of the pandemic for academic mothers and the need to do something. We also have published a few papers with data because again, we, we always need numbers to make it clear there is a, a general problem and we are not talking about our personal experiences. So we have conducted a survey here in Brazil. The survey was answered by more than 14,000 scientists, including grad students, postdocs, professors. And we showed what was being showed to uh, in all other countries that uh, women, especially mothers, and here in Brazil, especially black female uh, scientists, they were suffering the hardest hit of the pandemic when we were looking at the submission of uh, papers uh, and also the ability to uh, send out applications for grants, fellowships, and everything. So there is a clear impact. There was more pronounced for females, especially mothers and especially black females. So we have written a lot of things about how we should be doing something, not only discussing, but because there is no, nothing else to discuss. We know there is an impact. And the impact was not felt only in 2020. Because of the dynamic of publications, we'll produce something in 2020, we'll publish in 2023. So these gaps on the CVs will not happen only in a few years after the pandemic, but we'll also be seeing this impact for a couple of years more. 
And we need to do something about it because all these small gains we have regarding uh, some equity and some equality from others in science, we will lose if we were not doing anything. So we have done a lot of campaigns that uh, we need special grants for our women to return their, to their career. There is a lot of things that can be done. But sadly, I'll, just a few institutions that have adopted anything related to the pandemic and the careers of male scientists, especially mothers. Just want to tell you a little one thing. Uh, there is something that we are really proud of. Uh, one of the most shocking data we had with our survey in, uh, regarding the pandemic was that less than 10% of the graduate students that were mothers were able to keep up with their thesis and dissertations during the period of the, the pandemic, the worst of the pandemic in 2020, 2021. And one of the cause was the financial uh, situation, because again, everybody was impacted by the pandemic, but there are a lot of data that has shown that women also have suffered the biggest uh, economical uh, toll uh, because of the pandemic. So we wanted to do something because, okay, we have the data, but something has to be done. At the time of the parenting science movement, we didn't have any money to do anything, but we wanted to create a program to support mothers in science, especially grad students during the pandemic. So we decided to do a crowdfunding. It was one of the most uh, beautiful experience we had with the parenting science because in a little over a month, we were able to raise 120,000 reais. And with that money, we were able to assist 29 uh, grad students. So they can get to the end of their course and defend their uh, thesis or dissertations. And most of that students were solo mothers and they were black and indigenous uh, women. So it was really, really important for us. It was something that we wanted to do for so long to take the data and then actually do something about it. And we were able to do because of the network we had, because of all the support we have from the people that follow us and everything. Uh, the program was quite a success. We had a lot of international cover on the program. There is a, a, this, uh, this article on Nature that was published about the, uh, the campaign and everything. So it was really important for us. We decided to keep on with the program. So we have an edition now in 2022. Uh, the situation has changed a little bit because last year we were the winners of the Nature Research Award for inspiring uh, women in science. And the award came with a money prize. So we were able to use the money to start this second edition of the Tomorrow program. Now we are focusing on undergrad students, they were mothers, and we are offering um, fellowships for these students to keep up with their. Uh, scientific career and everything. So it's been really great that we were able to have a second edition of the, the program. As I mentioned, and I'm finishing, uh, the parenting science has grown a lot. And other than our ambassador program, that as I mentioned before, we are a group of 90 scientists now, and we have the, our regional pods. And that is really important because we are talking about a really huge country with really different uh, realities. So it's important that any kind of policy we develop, that it makes sense for their institutions. So our ambassadors, they are really important to tailor any initiative of the parenting science movement for their institutions. And having something that is, that is tailored to that institution uh, makes easier for changes to happen. So it was something that we started in 2020, this expansion of the parenting science. And it was really uh, something that has changed a lot of our work because we have now uh, a lot of people uh, joining us and we have the expertise to propose uh, changes that are meant uh, for that institution. We are also going international. So the parenting science now exists in Colombia too. We have the parenting science Colombia where our fellows in there are doing the same work we are doing here. They start the service to have data, uh, to have any kind of support to develop uh, policies regarding gender, more specifically motherhood. And we are talking about people in other, with 
people in other countries. So you probably have another chapters of the parenting science movement eventually. And just to finish, uh, we have done a lot and a lot of things have changed, but we still have a long, long way uh, to actually mend the gender gap and to change things for mothers in science. One thing that is a really big issue in Brazil is the uh, matter related to our leaves. So we have in Brazil uh, four to six months of maternity leave that is guaranteed by law. That is unacceptable in all the levels you can imagine, but it's also one of the reasons why women suffer a bigger hit on their career when they become moms, because we are not even letting fathers to do their part of the job because they have five days of leave. So we need to change that. That is not only for academia, it's for our society in general, but we need to change that. And the other thing is, until now, we do not have a law that will protect our students. There is no law that guarantees maternity leave for students at any level. And that is a big issue. So we need to change that. There are some projects, some law projects that are being evaluated right now regarding this matter. And I really hope they are implemented because we need to change that. As I mentioned before, we cannot talk about gender without talking about the main intersections of gender, including race. There is something else that we are working on the parenting sciences. All the data I have shown, uh, when we look at uh, mothers and fathers of children with disabilities or chronic diseases, that changes because when, the general data we have is that the biggest impact uh, women will suffer in their career is up to five to six year after, years after they become mom. But that changes if we're talking about mothers and fathers of children with disabilities. So that is another inter intersection we need to look at. And we are planning some projects on that. We still have a lot of problems in, uh, within our funding agencies. Even though some have adopted criteria for uh, CV evaluations, we do not have a program that is designed specifically for mothers, and we need that. There are a lot of examples from other parts of the world uh, where there is this return grants. So women will have this pause in their career and they'll have money to return to resume their careers. And that is really essential when we do not have that in here. Uh, a lot of universities have adopted some measures, some policies, but usually we're talking about one PhD program or one selection committee. We need sustainable changes. And that is only going to happen if, that, uh, if the, the changes are institutional. So uh, one example we have is here in my university, all the hiring processes for all the university now has a, a new uh, legislation and that uh, in this le legislation, there is a clause for motherhood. So we're talking about our uh, hiring processes. All CVs uh, in all processes will have this uh, different evaluation when we are talking about mothers. But that is one example. And we have today only two universities in Brazil that adopt that as a general rule. So we need these changes to become institutionalized if we want them to be sustainable. And in the end of the day, when it needs a cultural shift, we need to eliminate all the bias and discrimination we have against women in science, more particularly about mothers in science, especially when we are talking about our students. If we want to fix that leak pipeline, we need to address that. It's not easy because any cultural change does not happen overnight, but talking about it is the beginning. So we hope we'll see more changes in the future. Josuna, thanks everyone. Everything you ha we have accomplished so far uh, is not just our work. We had a lot of support from our community. Um, a lot of the actions we have planned, they were only, we were only able to implement because all the academic community has joined together and supported us. 
we also have to thank our uh, financial support. We always have a, a partnership with Serra Pilera, and we also have uh, funding from the uh, Para Mulheres na Ciência Award from the L'Oreal. And I guess that's it. Um, you can follow us in all social media. We are in there. You can look at Parenting Science, and you have our website. And that's it. Thank you, Fernanda. Is my connection okay? I was not really. I'm really. I, I don't know if you could I'm... hear the round of applause they they were giving to you. I did. I did. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. It's just I think my connection is a little bit unstable. Oh but... no! I think it's here. We are having. Oh, okay. But uh, everything under control, I guess. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, we can open for questions if someone. Uh, has any question? Does anyone have? Or are online people as well? They're just passing microphone. Uh, hello, I'm not sure if you can see me. <laughs> yes, I, I can see your hand. <laughs> okay, let, let me stand up. <laughs> okay. okay, okay. I see you. Okay, first of all, I just would like to thank you very much for this presentation. As a woman studying to be a scientist, I feel that it's very important that you say the, the words you said today. And I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity you gave me to listen to you. And my question, my first question uh, was about the first part of your presentation about the gender stereotype section. When you showed the, the graph about the the same gender telling that a child is brilliant, especially that, that graph. And I wanted to know if that, was, uh, if that graph was talking about a world tendency or a specific country. Well, the study was done in the US, uh, but I'm pretty sure it's uh, transferable <laughs> to other countries. But it was done only, uh, that paper, it was on the US. So uh, there are a lot of other studies that will assess some kind of uh, gender stereotypes uh, with in uh, in other countries, but that one is for the U.S. only the data. I see. And do you know at from when is that article? Like at what age? I think it was uh, 2013, but uh, um, I'm not sure. I can find it. I can share with Natalia the article, and then uh, she can pass along to you uh, all uh, the, the 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 paper. I think it was 2013, but I, I'm not sure. I I thought I had it on there, but maybe I have removed it. Sorry, I can't find it. I no, it's okay. Thank you. Uh, it because it has to do with my mm -hmm. second question actually, because when. Uh, I think about like if the articles are from 2010 or before, I start reflecting that in the last years we have a tendency in society of, how can I say, more presence of feminism, the LGBT community, minorities overall, I believe there has been a tendency of them having more presence and more voice. And I wanted to ask you, since we're talking about the field of science specifically, Science is one of the many, many fields uh, someone can go to to start their career. And do you think there is a bias of the people that go to science tends to be conservative? Okay, so I found the paper is 2017. So it's quite recent. Oh, so it's pretty close. Yeah, it's not old. And unfortunately, if we repeat the, that experiment now i i don't know if you would see any difference any major difference because well in general we still live in a society that even though we have more as you mentioned we have more visibility of uh, diversity in our universities and everything that doesn't translate to to all the sectors and i still think we would see something really close to what I was showing in 2017. Uh, so about your other question, if there is any particular 
uh, feature of people that go to science. And I don't know, I don't think there is anything that is really uh, particular to that. They are more conservative or anything. Uh, because I, I do believe we will produce the same things at all other sectors of the society. One thing that might be different, a little bit different, is because in science or in our academic institutions, the meritocracy myth is really ingrained. So, and maybe that makes things a little bit worse in academia or in science because we really believe that someone's success is solely influenced by their effort, their qualifications, or their abilities. So maybe that is something that has made things in academia a little worse. But I don't know if I, we could say that there are more people that are uh, conservative or conservative thing in, in science or anything. So maybe that question of when we enter uh, our uh, academic institutions is a very uh, easy uh, idea to sell that you know, we are all brilliant and if you can make it, it's because you had a lot of... Uh, it's your own merit. And of course, there is something that is related to that, but it's not all that. Uh, we cannot say that all men are more brilliant than women. And that's the reason we have this problem of uh, the underrepresentation. So I don't know. I don't know of any. Uh, and to be honest, it might just it might just be me not knowing it. But I don't know of any data saying that people in the university might have a different mind uh, about these things than in other sectors. I see. Thank you very much for your answer. Does anybody have any other questions? Uh, Hi. Uh, uh, Gabi, if you can read, I think she cannot see. Hello. Oh. She's going to change microphone, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. I'm here. My name is Gabby. <laughs> First Hi of all, Gabby. I would like to thank you very much for your presentation and for all the work and effort that you and the movement have been putting into studying these things, analyzing and uh, bringing it to the whole community. I totally agree with the point of awareness. So yeah, thank you very much for all of this again. And um, I know that also is a long road and it's a lot of things to talk about all the time, but I was curious if uh, you guys have also been uh, taking a look into the leg legislation and everything that surrounds it for parenthood in case of adoption of children. I don't know if it's the same in the case of um, yeah, I don't know how to say it in English, but not adoption. <laughs> that That's my question. You, you can talk in Portuguese, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, but that, so. that was it. Just if you guys have taken a look into <laughs> okay. adoption cases as well. Okay, so uh, regarding legislation, uh, what do we have about leaves uh, uh, here in Brazil? Is that uh, adoption, adopters, they have up to 120 days of leave. Uh, one of the parents uh, have one 120 days of paid leave, the same way as for uh, the maternity leave. And if they are employees of the public sector as the federal professor, university professors and so on, they have 180 days. So, because there was some uh, legislation saying there cannot be any difference between uh, the rights a mom, um, a biological mom have and an uh, adoption, uh, adoption mom have. So the, the leaves, they are the same. What do we have in, in, that is a, a something we're trying to uh, work a little bit here is, for instance, when we're talking of, uh, about same gender uh, parents, uh, couples, they adopt someone. Usually one of them will have a leave, the other mom will not have any kind of leave, or maybe they will have five days as the paternity leave will, will be the case. So we have a lot of um, 
uh, people contacting us and saying, oh, that is happening. I do not have the right to leave and, 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 and so on. So our legislation here in Brazil, we do not have anything specific uh, for same-sex parents or anything like that. So that is an issue. And again, it's something that is uh, outside our, our university, but that we will influence uh, the university. Something we are always wanted to do is to see if there is any difference on the impacts. And we were actually discussing that in, in our universe because I mentioned that our hiring processes here in our university has adopted a motherhood clause. Uh, and we were discussing, okay, if we are talking about same-sex parents, who are the ones that can benefit from this legislation with the correction factor for the CV evaluation and so on. And we do not have any data that uh, has this uh, focus on uh, adoption or anything like that. And even in our studies, when we have done the surveys and everything, usually our sample for people that are not biological parents, they are uh, adopters, uh, is really small. And it's kind of hard to, to have any uh, statistical analysis or anything. So it is something we need to look at because again, especially for in the cases of two moms, who is gonna be, uh, can, who can use all these uh, policies and, and everything. So it is something you want to do, but uh, again, we have this issue with uh, people engaging our studies. First of all, usually it's only women. <laughs> So even in the, the pandemic survey that we have like almost 15,000 uh, answers, 70% uh, were women. So we have this issue. And usually uh, when we try to look at specific groups, adoption, uh, parents of children with disabilities and, and so on, we have a really small sample size. And it's kind of hard to get any data from that. But it is something that is important because we need, as we develop support policies, and for us, motherhood is equal if we are talking about adoption or uh, birthing a, a child, it might have something uh, in this le legislation that sees it different. One example I can give you is uh, the CV lattice, the, the platform. Uh, it's only motherhood, it's only maternity leave that is inside it. And even though uh, a mom could put the information there, if uh, they are uh, adopters, I'm not sure if that is the right term, I'm really sorry. Uh, the right term will be adoption leave. And it might look like, oh, well, it's just one word, but if we're talking about rights and legislation, that is different. So we have it ask for CNPK to change it and leave uh, maternity adoption leave that hasn't changed yet. So it's a really important uh, issue and we are hoping to do a few things uh, in the near future. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. I talk a lot people, <laughs> so uh, you can cut me off if I want. Does anyone have any other questions? I don't know if they're just passing it. Hi, Fernanda. My name is Gabriel. Hi. Um, I'm a father, uh, and my companion, the mother of my daughter, is also in academia. And um, unfortunately, um, I could. Um, like live these disparities you have mentioned. Um, one really easy ex example is that I'm here in this two month course while she isn't. And um, one, one of my questions can be like, I don't know, a, b a little bit like, Maybe I should look for these answers myself, but I'm going to ask. So what do you think I could do in the family circle inside the, the house to, to help her to, to um, ease these disparities and 
And I have another question. You mentioned that in your institution, motherhood is accounted for in the selection processes. And is it accounted for only for job positions or also PhD positions? And do you know other institutions in Brazil that account for it? So I have these two questions. Okay. Uh, well, uh, what you could do is kind of hard to answer because, well, I know I don't know you personally, so it's hard to tell. But in general, what can be done is to actually divide the tasks, and it, and it's, it's, it might sound simple, but I have a, a really uh, it's well, it's not fun, but it's funny. Uh, example because uh, during the pandemic we have done a, a study here at the university with uh, students their parents both moms and dads and it was quite surprising when we asked the students uh, if they had a partner uh, with whom they divide the the caring for the children all the labor at home and everything and women, the female students, I don't know, it was maybe 25% that said they had a partner that actually divided all the caring and all the labor at home. And for these, the, the, the uh, male students, 75% said that they divided equally the, the, uh, all the responsibilities for the children or at home. So there is a really mismatch perception of what to divide the work is and when we were talking about with the female students and we said okay but a lot of the parents the, the fathers are saying they divide equally the work at home and they would say okay my partner will take out the trash and he thinks he is dividing the work properly but it's not i'm not saying it's your case because i don't know you <laughs> but maybe really look into uh, how is the division of caring for the children because it's really ingraining us ingraining in us that women have more ways for caring uh, women are biological biologically fit to care and they are more talented in caring all the stuff and that is it's really just a cultural thing so it's not easy to actually see things, but by, that might be the way because only if we actually divide the work, uh, things will be different. Even though, even in cases like I can tell about my experience, my, my husband is also a professor at the university and he's, he has done maybe more than I have. Uh, regarding taking care of our children. He's the one that stayed at home for two years after we had our second uh, son. So he actually does a lot and divide the stuff. But the way people see it and uh, how we are cobrados, uh, I don't know, it's a palavra for you. Uh, uh, about our parenthood, it's, it's quite different. Because, for instance, if I miss a meeting because I have to take my children uh, to a doctor or anything, people will judge that I'm in not committed to that. If he does that, oh my God, he's such a nice father. That's so nice he's doing that. So even uh, we have couples that actually do divide things equally, we'll have this uh, different in perception that we will still affect more women than men. So that's what I can tell you about. Do you actually divide all the work and everything? And maybe there is something to look at it. You mentioned that you are here and she's not. And that is a really big issue we have because uh, going to conference or anywhere after you become a mom is quite hard. And there is no support usually anywhere you go for moms and, and so on and so it's a really uh, complex situation but it starts at home and actually dividing everything up your other question oh if i had examples okay so here in your in our university the only general uh, uh, regulation is for the hiring process for our concursus not sure how to say that in english 
and but there are programs that adopt the motherhood class for a PhD or master in, anyway for graduate selection processes. I only know one example of uh, an institutional legislation about it, and it is from the Federal Uni uh, Fluminense Federal University, Universidade Federal Fluminense, do Rio de Janeiro. Um, there they do have an institutional uh, legislation that says that all uh, graduate programs, they have to incorporate the uh, affirmative action for moms in the selection process for PhDs students or a master's student. So there is only one institution as a whole that adopted, but we do not do have a lot of examples of particular PhD programs that incorporated this clause. Uh, there is, there was uh, one uh, selection process, I think it was just for master's students uh, in INPA, the Instituto Nacional de Pesquisas Amazonicas. They had quotas for moms. Uh, for the fellowships for the master students. So there are examples, uh, but institutional, I only know from the Federal University, Fluminense Federal University. Thank you very much. You answered pretty much everything. And just as a, a comment, um, what you said is um, entirely true about how society sees um, the division and everything. Um, when my daughter turned, um, I believe, four months old, we started to divide, trying to divide the day in half so the division would be more equal. I stay with the, the baby in the morning and she stayed in the afternoon. And by doing that, I, I, I noticed that everyone around me um, started to respect me more and the time I lose but for jobs and to really do my things actually wa wasn't that important because people started to like ease things for me and okay, you're so such a good father and some, some things like that. And for her, she it was almost impossible to find jobs that she could do in a half period. So, um, just a comment about that. Yeah, it's uh, there is a lot of there are a lot of studies uh, talking about the uh, motherhood penalty and the fatherhood bonus, and that is quite common, including in academia and science, unfortunately. Does anyone have any other questions? If not, I I have some, some two questions for <laughs> now. Um, you said about a cultural shift that um, that we need to talk more about um, these issues um, about the sexual harassment. There's a uh, a topic that more people are commenting. In your opinion, uh, what be your per, uh, what would be uh, your personal recommendation of um, someone that suffers that uh, at a university? And um, what? And uh, the second question would be, uh, what type of answer would give you would you give you to an advisor that asks about their personal life? Let's say they they start uh, having interviews with uh, pers and having prospecting advisors and they ask us about, oh, um, do you want to form a family? Do you intend to have children? What would be your recommendations on this kind of questions and if they have to answer about that? Okay, so about harassment, it's a really sensitive topic and of course the recommendation would be to find um, the path within the university to denunciate and make a complaint, a formal one. But of course, I know how hard that is. And especially in our institutions, maybe there are one or two examples that we can find uh, a serious committee or something that will take the complaints and do something. So I know it's hard, yeah. Um, but I think the only way is to report. 
there's no way around it if you want to change it. And but in, by no means I would judge anyone that suffers and, and doesn't report because I can only imagine how hard that is. Uh, in um, culture, there is so, so sexist as we have here in our universities. What we need to do is to push for our universities to implement uh, regulations, moral conduct, uh, ethics, or things like that, and actually do something about it. Because, well, the victims themselves are not going to be able to change anything. We need our institutions to engage in that. So it's not easy. But I think that's that's the way because until we have uh, the actual reports or anything, people will always say that it's always just an exception that doesn't happen and everything. So we need numbers, and one of the numbers are the incidents, and we need to have the reports. So that will probably be, if someone uh, comes looking uh, for any device, that will. Is what I would advise, and we have done in the past because, well, it's not uncommon for us to receive this kind of um, recommendation. I'm a coordinator of the undergrad biology course here in Brazil and um, here in, in our university. So we have been through a few of these situations, and that's what we recommend. Uh, the university do have uh, Ovidoria, I'm not sure how to say that in English. So you can report and we try to support people the way we can. Your other question was, oh, sorry, I forgot. It was, uh, if, uh, let's say oh, they're okay. prospecting the advisors. <laughs> okay. Yeah, in the interview, the advisor okay. asks about their, their okay. family. Okay. okay, so the thing is, uh, people should not be allowed to ask this, the, those, those questions. So uh, one thing we are always trying to discuss with the universities and institutions that you have to have a really clear rule that people cannot ask personal questions related to parenthood, to, to if you intend to get married, if you are married or anything, because those questions are made only for women. Never in the history of anything I've heard uh, a man being asked if they are married, if they are going to have children, if they do have children. So there should be an institutional regulation about it, saying you cannot. And the thing, the thing is, it happens. I, we always know, we know that there are cases that happen. Uh, my advice would be to respond uh, honestly. You cannot lie, you do not have children if you do, because there is not something you can hide. Uh, but if you feel comfortable, of course, uh, you should reply that uh, it's something that should not be asked. And there is something that does not change in any way on uh, the qualification of the candidate or anything. But of course, I know when you are being interviewed, it's not easy to reply in this line of, uh, uh. so that will be my recommendation. And if you feel that you've been disadvantaged because of that question you should report we had cases uh, in again in hiring processes that uh, female candidates were asked about having children and anything and one of those cases they took forward the, they made a complaint and the, the concourse again I'm not sure how to say uh, the concourse was cancelled and they have to read them uh, a few parts of the, con uh, the concourse so that would be my recommendation. You have to answer, honestly, and there's no way of lying about it. I wouldn't recommend that. But if you feel confident enough, you can say that there is nothing, uh, there is not a question that should be asked and that doesn't imp implicate in anything uh, in the selection process and the, pe the person that should not be doing this kind of uh, a thing and report it if you feel you can. Uh, okay, thank you so much for, for answering. Um, there is two more questions from the audience. <laughs> Let me just, they're passing microphone. Hi, Fernanda. Uh, my name is Melina. 
um, I was thinking about uh, harassment uh, cases that happens it at the universities. And last year, there was a, um, a case that had a, a big repercussion in the media of a professor that committed harassment against several students uh, over several years and at the Unihill. And um, I was thinking that this is something very common, but usually the person that commits the harassment is a researcher very respected by the institution, by the other professors, and everyone pretends that are that not are not seeing anything and just try to cover up the case or the m many cases and uh, usually nothing happens just the victim the victims are exposed and the professor just stay uh, with the same status that uh, that they have so how can we articulate more effective actions and ways to like remove <laughs> this person <laughs> from the uh, from the work environment and I don't know because okay so uh, well we all heard about this particular case uh, well Again, it's always not easy to come forward and report. And there is a lot of exposition of the victim. And that is not um, something easy. I know personally one of the uh, women that have reported this particular um, uh, professor. Oh, usually, it's a really, really, really long process. Uh, I've witnessed some of these processes in our university, and it takes years. So, because of course they have to be do uh, do the do uh, diligence, uh, and they have to be pretty sure. Of course, you're gonna fire someone, so it, it's gonna take many many years. And you are really uh, you are right when you say that people usually are protected by your, their reputation as a science, as if things would be oh he's a really good science. There is no justification for any of it. Uh, behavior they're involved with harassment or anything so it's not easy and again it's a cultural thing and there is no way around it um, other than reporting and trying to uh, pressure our institutions to do things about it that's why we, we need to have uh, really rigid legislations in our universities regarding harassment and to be honest there is maybe a couple of universities that have any regulation about explicitly about harassment and so I think that's the way we have to move forward we have to have uh, um, legislation at least at least I, I know that having a legislation a regulation about it is not going to make everything disappear and like there is no more harassment because we do have this legislation but it's the start and well it's again, as I said before, I know it's not easy, and I completely understand if many of these women that have suffered this kind of harassment uh, do not report it, but it's the only way we have to know it. We have cases of people that are members of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences that have been reported, reported by harassment, even judicial cases like they are going to uh, justice. Uh, with these cases and people are still in their arms. So again, it's very ingrained and it has to do with this really sexist society we live in, the, the women's world. There is no way in uh, when we are comparing to like listening to the two sides of the story. So I, it's not easy, but I'm really glad they came, they came forward because having this repercussion maybe it's not going to be overnight, it's not going to be in a year, but maybe this professor in particular will suffer some consequences in the near future, maybe. I don't know. But it's a really big issue. And 
some universities are trying to deal with that. It's going to take a while. Thank you. There is another uh, question. Uh, hello, it's me again. Uh, the one in the back right here. Uh, I didn't I say my it. name. My name is Paula. Uh, I was going to say another comment, but after Melina's question, I actually I'm going to make another one that came to my mind. Because when we're talking about harassment, I was listening to her question and your answer, and I could not help but remember a case of harassment that happened in my own, in my university. I was in the classroom. I was there to see it. And the thing is, what 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 is special about my story is that the professor who said what was said was a woman. And I don't remember what question was made by the students who suffered the harassment, but I remember that was a very innocent question. And not only the professor answered in a way that seemed like she was incompetent, she also said that the student was only here in, here like in the university to date men was something that she said for the whole classroom to, s to hear, which was shocking because it had no relation whatsoever to her question. And I'm making this comment because the professor who said that was a woman, so even women who are in the science field can uh, continue this pattern of difference in genders, harassment, and everything else, and I suppose like that is something we need to worry about like when these behaviors come come from people who are s who could be subject of this harassment and is maintaining the system as it is so that was a comment i wanted to make thanks paula and that is really something we need to talk about it because we talk about having women in the leadership positions and that's something we need to change the system and everything but we need women there, they are aware of their own biases and their own prejudice and their own problems because otherwise it doesn't change anything if we have a women in there, they are not capable of understanding the system. Uh, some of the most absurd things I've heard uh, with the parenting science movement, it came from women. When we started the movement, a lot of women will come up and say, oh, there is no reason for this. You do not have to talk about motherhood because there is no impact. I'm here. I'm a mom of these many children and everything. Uh, to the point that one young researcher said that she didn't see any reason whatsoever to discuss parenthood in science because she didn't feel anything, any impact or anything. And it was quite funny because I knew that person and uh, she was from my university. And a few year, uh, weeks after she said that in a public meeting, she said in front of everyone, so she was not embarrassed about her opinion. She was pretty confident on it. And she posted online because, well, we were acquaintances, so I was following her. And she posted she was going to a conference and she was taking her child with her mom on this side. So a lot of times uh, women will have, a hard, will have a hard time to see some of these issues because they cannot look at other realities. They don't, they don't see it because they are used to what they and their experience are. And that was pretty clear for me, a pretty clear example because, well, it's easy to maintain your career if you have support if you have resources and and so on so a lot of things well i have cried a lot in a lot of the seminars we have gave with the parenting science and most of the time it was because of women saying something really horrible to me because they don't see they are, they have hard time to seeing other realities not the ones they are living and i see a few reasons for that other than people are just used to what they are living they do not see the people around them uh, it's not easy to say anything about motherhood specifically i know you're, you're talking about harassment but, but 
give you an example of our motherhood because um, we are supposed to love our own motherhood more than anything. And people cannot separate uh, the love for our children and what it is to be a mom. So I see a lot of mothers that will say, oh, there is nothing that happened to me with my career after I became a mom because they don't want to face this reality that there is some negative impacts in becoming a mom. And regarding harassment, uh, some women to survive the system, they start behaving like the system expects them to. So they will have hard shells. They we will incorporate a lot, of, a lot of the features that we do not uh, want to see in them, but they do it because it's a survival thing too. You just you fit into the system and start reproducing it. It's not easy to uh, to fight these unconscious things we have. I have a lot of examples regarding motherhood, but harassment is another thing where you you end up absorbing things and okay that. I've been through that, I didn't suffer anything, so that's normal. And it's sad when uh, it's women that are perpetrating this, but it happens. It's another thing that we need to change. And it's gonna take a while, but the good news is I think the younger generations, like you guys and, and what people that are coming after you, they'll have a different mindset. Even my generation, there are uh, some changes already happening. The thing is, in our institutions, we still have a lot of old people <laughs> that will perpetrate this kind of uh, behavior. But things, I know not entirely, but things are changing. I'm still there. I'm not sure. I think you are frozen. We are. I see I'm <laughs> yeah. there. Okay. It's because of the internet. <laughs> All right. We are here. <laughs> no problem. Okay, now I saw hands moving. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I think uh, time is up. Uh, Fernanda, thank you so much for your lecture. It's always uh, inspirational and, and wonderful to hear about, uh, about you and uh, about the parents and science movement. I guess the students enjoyed the lecture as I had. So please, everyone, let's give her a round of applause. Thank you, guys. It's always a pleasure, Natalia. Thank you, Fernanda. See you next time. See you. <laughs> See Bye. You. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.